well done for making it through the first full day. <laughs> Nearly <coughs> half a day for you. <laughs> Still landing. And, uh, it'll take a little time to get into the rhythm and the practice, but hopefully it's starting to happen. And you're taking every opportunity to develop loving kindness to yourself body, your mind, and to each other in the activities that we do. So now, here's the most interesting part of the day, because I have no idea what's in here. <laughs> and Baboozle's going to choose. <laughs> first question, which one will it be? <laughs> These are, we still call it Q&A for some reason, but uh, I don't have all the answers. So you're putting something to me and you're seeing what comes out. <laughs> so it may or may not land, and if it doesn't land, you can always ask again tomorrow. Or we can see how much time there is to have some questions in person if need be. <coughs> First question, can you talk more about how to develop the attitude of metta in daily life as a cultivation? Oh, sorry, versus cultivation. Especially if ill will or agitation has already arisen in a situation. <coughs> Excellent. So, uh, not tomorrow, but the day after, I'm planning to give a whole talk on working with the obstacles to loving kindness. And uh, in the meantime, you'll notice them arising, which is a wonderful sign that it's working to illuminate those places that we're still not able to suffuse with metta. So um, here the question says the attitude versus cultivation, but in my experience, the two really support each other. So the more we practice directing our thoughts towards loving kindness and we cultivate those qualities on the cushion, the more it naturally starts to flow over into our lives. So I suppose it's a bit like, that's a bad analogy probably, but when we're practicing loving kindness, we're kind of filling up our tank and the glasses on our eyes, if you like, or in our mind are becoming like really rosy and really beautiful. And then we go out of here and a little bit of energy gets diffused and maybe the strong rose tint gets a little bit weaker but we still have some of it and the more we develop it the more that remains so it starts to spill over into our body speech and mind but there are things we can do to develop the attitude of loving kindness and um, in different ways one way again is using kind of reflective thought so not the phrases which are simple and which act as a kind of anchor for the mind but more trying to look from different angles at a situation. So, <clears throat> for example, usually ill will and agitation arises not just to a situation, but to other people in the situation. <laughs> to other people, the way they behave, or even the fact that they're giving you something you don't really want to do. And one really um, nice way to handle that, if you can't do it there and then, is to reflect afterwards. Yeah, sometimes it's too late once the ill will or agitations have arisen, but you can go back and reflect alone in your room and you can think about things from a different angle. For example, I guess it's more likely in daily life, but say somebody's cut you up in the car, you know, cut, is that right? Cut you up or cut you off? <laughs> so it's dead, very scary. Okay, we won't go to the cutting you up just yet. The cutting you off. <laughs> there are instructions for that as well. But the cutting you off. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to think, well, you know, maybe this person has, a, maybe there's a pregnant woman in the car and she's, the waters have just broken, or maybe this person needs the loo, or maybe they're going to visit somebody who's sick. And it's an emergency call, or 
maybe they're just really agitated and they're unaware of everyone around them and that means they're obviously not at peace right now. So when we can reflect in these ways, or you can remember a time that you behaved like that and remember what the causes were there and maybe this person's in a similar situation. They're just not aware of what they're doing right now. So this can be really helpful. And another way is to um, to look at the other side of the person. So if anger's arising towards a certain quality that they have, or maybe you think they don't have, maybe uh, either try and remember a time that you did see that quality in them, or you can look at different qualities that they have. So, I mean, it's very creative, you know, and you have to get kind of... Uh, used to this kind of approach. But it's a method that one of my teachers, Ajahn Brahmali, uses a lot, especially on his walking path. Something will happen in the monastery that day and then he'll go back and instead of just sitting down and kind of fuming, you know, <laughs> he'll walk up and down the path and try and reflect. And there's different methods. I mean, if I say too much, I won't get through the other questions, but there's a... Sometimes we can't have metta, but we can have compassion. You know? Um... And sometimes we can have equanimity, but I'll talk a bit more about how those relate to each other tomorrow. And also, if you do have ill will and agitation, remember to have metta towards yourself, because you're actually the one that's suffering at that time, <laughs> more than the other person, hopefully, if you haven't blasted at them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sure it's probably quite subtle. But uh, if it's already there, then then see if you can just... Acknowledge the pain of that in yourself. First of all, at least you're aware it's there. And then, okay, see if you can welcome it and actually ask it what it needs. Maybe that ill will and agitation needs soothing and compassion and a bit of your own tender care. So you can go and sit down for a while and be with your own agitation and, and ill will. After a while, you start to realise it's kind of futile, it only hurts you. But that takes time. I mean, only people in the third stage of enlightenment have no more ill will. So be a little bit gentle with yourself. Yeah. But I, I would say, just to conclude, it's really the practice, a daily practice of metta meditation that really has the lasting results. It just starts to kind of become more and more your character. It doesn't mean you don't ever have ill will or agitation, but you come out of it much more quickly. And um, you have something to come out of it too, to a much more pleasant state of loving kindness. You want to choose the next one? Okay. Oh, <laughs> please. Hi. Oh, nearly. You want to read it? <laughs> oh, we didn't bring your glasses, sorry. <laughs> I mean, people on the recording are going to think I'm crazy. But I'm playing with a little deer. You have to be here to understand. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> what are the best ways for a lay person to deepen their commitment to the path of practice while staying as a lay person? Exclamation mark, as if you're scared not to. <laughs> Yeah, okay, you can, it's all right. You don't have to look like this or shave your head, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, what are the best ways for a lay person to deepen their commitment to the path of practice? I would say one way is um, probably Ajahn Brahm's method of uh, reflecting at the end of your meditation each time you sit. Just re we haven't really done that yet. We've more spread the metta at the end of the sit. But sometimes you can just notice how you feel at the end of the sitting compared to how you felt before. And acknowledge that, yes, there's a feeling of more groundedness, more awareness, maybe a little bit more peace. Um, <coughs> maybe the thoughts have calmed down a bit, and if not, at least you can see the patterns and you're aware um, so this is very encouraging. We need a lot of encouragement to um, deepen our commitment rather than a kind of um, a very high standard to try to achieve. So see if you can encourage yourself in that way. And um, 
Secondly, very important, is to try to have spiritual friends, to try and make uh, friendships, relationships with other people on the path. Um, if you do have a place like this to come to, you're very lucky. I think there's a lot going on in Devon, monasteries as well. And this is why we want to start a place. We already have a little Vihara in Oxford. And um, it's beautiful to see that I'm not just the central point of it anymore. I'm, of course, started it off and people um, came to kind of see what it was all about and um, hear my teachings, really hear the Buddha's teachings. But now the beautiful thing is that the people who come start to know each other and start to develop friendships among themselves. And one of the ladies who's actually become our treasurer now, she said to me, I need this community for my practice. I need this. <laughs> And um, and this is really wonderful because then you start to grow with others and they can start to reflect back to you as well. Sometimes we don't see our own progress because we generally have this negativity bias that sees our faults and we see what's yet to be, you know, left to be done. Um, and you can't see it from week to week, but you can start to see it from year to year. And so when others reflect that back to you, that's also very nice. I mean, even this year, I was in uh, Perth on my annual three-month retreat with my teacher, and uh, it was strange because I actually had a very difficult time due to physical health. And um, this condition that I mentioned, it's like a, a small intestine bacterial overgrowth with lots of other bits and bobs. Anyway, lots of inflammation, lots of acid reflux, and lots of gas, and... And it kind of got a lot, lot worse to the point where I could barely do much sitting meditation, which is what I love to do. So, you know, it was quite frustrating and it had calmed down for a week or so and then it would kick off again and I'd even be vomiting acid and it was really bad. Um, <clears throat> and after a while, I just started to realise I was going to have to accept the situation. You know, we're very slow to learn, even I'm very slow to learn sometimes. Because <laughs> I kept thinking, you know, when I get over this bout, then I'll be able to start sitting again. And then I thought, hang on a minute, can you only cultivate the mind when you're sitting? What about the rest of the time? I mean, so long as I'm cultivating wholesome states, it doesn't really matter. And I realised, yeah, I am actually keeping my mind on the Dhamma, I'm uh, staying, you know, keen to practice. Maybe the conditions aren't there right now, but I can do walking meditation. I can just really look after my body and be really gentle with it. And uh, at some point in that retreat, I didn't think I was making progress. But then all these uh, people from Singapore who come every year to join the retreat and also at the end of the retreat, they start saying, Oh, Sadhu, Sadhu, you're so much more joyful than before. Sadhu, Sadhu, <laughs> something's changed. <laughs> sadhu means like, well done. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking, huh? Actually, it was quite a difficult retreat. Maybe I'm just more extroverted or something. But they were all, there were quite a few of them said the same. <laughs> and then I realised, yeah, I had let go of some clinging, some expectation around retreat and... Uh, I had developed a genuine sense of equanimity and acceptance of the situation. So sometimes progress manifests in unexpected ways and we'll only be deepening some qualities, right, at any one time. Not all, but some retreats or some situations in life will strengthen certain things like your capacity to serve or be good at websites. I'm still not there. <laughs> and other other situations will help you meditate on metta and develop a bit more peace so see if you can uh... the other thing I guess is to reflect on your own good qualities like we did at the beginning of the um, last meditation to bring it up remember things that you've done situations where not to enhance your ego but just to teach you about cause and effect what happens when you Sacrifice a little bit or do something, give something that's difficult to give. And what else can you do to deepen your commitment is um, keep coming to retreats and do try to have some kind of daily practice. But uh, I mean, I started with Goenkaji, with the Vipassana uh, tradition of Sayaji Ubakin, really. And um, it's quite a disciplined practice. And our teacher used to say, 
if you can commit to two hours a day without missing an hour for a year, then it will stay with you for the rest of your life. And I was fortunate to be in the position where I was living in India and I was there with a one-way ticket with the rest of my life to give to the path. And I just put all the causes in place to make sure I would develop that two-hour-a-day practice and it stayed with me for the rest of my life so far. (laughs) But you don't have to do two hours. I realise now that that can be off-putting to many and the danger is you'll think, oh, I didn't do it. I might as well give up, you know. So have a smaller goal, but have some goal, like some kind of daily practice, even if you miss it for a day or two. But five minutes to incline the mind towards whatever you want to practice. It might be just being aware of your body. It might be breath meditation. It might be loving kindness. Just see if you can have some, some kind of daily practice and you'll start to see the results. So that's the best way, rather than making yourself do it. Mm. Next question. I'm giving, going a bit long on each one because there's not so many. They tend to increase as the retreat goes on, which is, I don't know if it's a good sign or a bad sign. How do I keep calm abiding when people around me cannot cooperate? (laughs) Everyone laughs. Is that because everyone knows that situation? (laughs) People around me cannot cooperate and tend to be black and white. Hmm. This is our judging mind coming in, isn't it? Judgment is really the opposite of compassion, unfortunately. I've just kind of figured that one out. I think, anyway, that's my logic. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, we can't keep anything, right? We can't keep calm. We can't keep angry. We can't keep full of meta. We can't keep full of anxiety. It all changes all the time. So one of the difficulties there is uh, trying to keep the calm in situations where that's not your experience. So I would say instead of uh, adding suffering to suffering (laughs) by wishing you were calm when you're not, it's much better perhaps to um, notice the causes for the agitation and for the uh, judgment of those around you. And just see it with interest, not with more judgment, but just with eyes of curiosity how is it that you're moving out of a place of ease and into a place of irritation, agitation, judgment of other people? And I'm not judging you for judging other people. We all judge all the time. Uh, (laughs) And it's not easy, especially when uh, you are starting to practice and people around you aren't changing, right? And you're not really having the same values anymore. So that's difficult. But see if you can notice and... uh, Sometimes it might be that you can uh, just develop a bit more patience, a bit more sympathy and compassion for those people. Um, Other times, if you're feeling fragile, you might have to kind of just gently bow out, and that's okay as well. I mean, this is not a specific situation, so I, I don't know if another time you might want to ask specifically, especially if it's something very personal that you have to be with a lot of the time but uh, I think one of the best ways is not to change others but just to manifest your practice as best you can Um, over time you'll become more tolerant and people might start to think oh there is a different way to be maybe if you're a little more nuanced in your views then they'll also get influenced perhaps yeah, I mean, one other thing is um, if their views are very black and white, try not to criticise them. Sometimes we have to call out wrong view, especially if it's, I don't know, racism or um, anything that's really harmful that you see happening. But try to address the behaviour and not judge the person if it's possible at all. So, you know, using like non-violent communication sometimes when... I hear you say this, I feel this way, and that causes me 
pain or sadness because I value kindness. Something like this is not easy. Um, but that will elicit a much more empathic response than, how can you speak that way? <laughs> you know, as a Buddhist, we always think this way. <laughs> so, yeah. Try your best, but... Um, be willing to to adapt to the situation and um, acknowledge that you're not going to be calm all of the time. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, I mean, when I used to visit my, I shouldn't really say this on tape, but anyway, it's true that when I used to visit my parents and uh, maybe especially in the early days of my practice, I was really committed to these two hours a day. So I would, whenever I found myself getting, you know, escalating, in imitation and something that triggered me, I'd just go meditate. And it really helped. It really, really helped. It's amazing the perspective it can give you. And then you can go back into the situation a little bit refreshed. Mm. Oh, you're going to the bottom. Mm. This one's hard to get. Right. This um, bamboozle was a gift on my bikuni uh, ordination day, which was about ten years ago. <laughs> Why is it easier to be kind to others than ourselves? Mm-hmm. Well, that's because you know yourself better than others. <laughs> <laughs> you know others. <laughs> But I don't mean it like that. <laughs> it's not, that doesn't justify it. <laughs> but it's also our identification with ourselves, right? It's like, I must be this way. Because I am the centre of the universe and I must be perfect and always this way and not that way. And yeah, uh, and we know all our weaknesses. So they're going to show up, Right? And with others, I don't know. It does seem to be easier for me as well. Um, I don't think that's the case for everybody, but uh, I guess generally we don't have to live with others every moment of every day. (laughs) That's another thing, isn't it? And uh, I don't know. I guess we've just been conditioned to be kinder to others than ourselves. Our whole society conditions that. Even Christianity says always, you know, love... What does it say? Well, sometimes it says, love thy neighbour as thyself, but there's another thing it says, which is kind of very self-sacrificing. You know, Mm -hmm. you have to give more to others than yourself, sacrifice yourself for everybody else. And and in our culture, we're not taught to be kind to ourselves. It's seen almost as um, egotistical or indulgent or, or whatever. So I think it's just the way we've been conditioned by society that we've got to achieve, we've got to push ourselves, be really perfect in every area. And uh, as a result, you know, we, we just focus on our faults. And it's perhaps also because we're not, um, like when we're in society, we act kindly to others because we have to, right? At work, we're doing things for others. In our families, we're doing things for others. But it's harder to act out kindness to ourselves, I think. Like, how do you really act it to yourself? It's more an inward thing, isn't it? It's more a kind of how you relate to yourself. Maybe some of the things you do for yourself, but we're generally doing stuff for others. So we haven't practiced it as much. I think that's the main thing. We haven't practiced it as much. And we've been... We, we identify too much with ourselves in a negative way. We expect so much from ourselves, far more than we'd expect from anyone else. But the good news is, we can change that by practicing loving kindness to ourselves. And after a while, it does start to even out when we really see that we are just the same as anybody else, and you know, we don't have to be better or more perfect to be loved. Yeah, it's the ego really. It it, it singles ourselves out from others. Whereas actually we're just the same as everyone else. So if others deserve love, so do we. You know, if you see that from other people's perspective, it's obvious. I don't know. 
I would quite like to ask other people's thoughts on that, but I'll go through the last two first. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, can we this at the end? <laughs> Anu Kampa's journey so far. Update. What's the news? And how can we help? <laughs> Crikey. All right, I thought I'd left it all behind. <laughs> okay, for those that don't know, or most of you do, uh, the update is that things are happening right now and we don't know what's going to happen this week. It's very exciting. Anu Kampa, for those who don't know, is uh, my uh, the charity that I founded to start a uh, monastery for women who want to train to full ordination and all people to come and stay as guests and also to share the Dhamma, especially uh, the teachings of early Buddhism, as far and wide as we can. And the word Anukampa is relevant because it means compassion, particularly a kind of empathic compassion that, that acts to alleviate suffering. Again, it's not that kind of passive, sentimental uh, there's nothing wrong with passive metta, but you know it's not just this kind of it stays on the cushion, it stays in your mind. It should move you to act if really love is love or compassion is compassion. So um, in the suttas it always says the Buddha taught out of anukampa. Mm. Uh, whatever he did that was you know active in terms of serving, which he did for 45 years, was motivated by anukampa. So... Uh, Journey so far is a big one. We started eight years ago, and uh, we now have a little vihara in Oxford. It's the first and only for Buddhist nuns fully ordained in this country. Uh, I've been alone so far, but I do have a friend from Perth who's coming again to stay for about five months next year. So there'll be two of us. And the news underlined... <laughs> it is underlined. <laughs> it's like a press report. <laughs> uh, is that uh, Ajahn Brown was here recently? He only went back a couple of weeks ago, and we travelled all over the place together. We went to see my family and his family, which was very nice, very lovely actually. Uh, almost like meeting extended family because we seem to have a northern connection and natural ease among us all. And. Uh, on the way back down from Liverpool, somewhere north of Liverpool, um, we were on the train and I was feeling a bit like, oh, we're never going to get a bigger monastery. And he was saying, well, the only thing we can really do is give you a loan. And I was thinking, oh, I don't want a loan. I'm going to be in debt and it's only me doing all the teaching. And then I kind of pulled myself together and I was like, OK, let me look online. So I looked online and this property came up that was the right size, the right area, and just about reachable, almost, if we sell the current Vihara. So I thought, right, I'm phoning them. So I phoned them right there and then. And then uh, we only had one free morning during his tour, but I asked them if we could go and visit it on that morning, and amazingly we did. And uh, it just felt like a lot more spacious, secluded, still close to Oxford, and uh, I've been searching online and in reality now for years and nothing this close to being the right blend of seclusion and accessibility, the right floor plan to have a quiet room for meditation, a big room for reception, for lunch, dana. And uh, nothing quite that close has come up so far. So... Uh, we thought, OK, let's see what's next. And, and we've taken steps since then. It's only a couple of weeks ago, which is why I've been so tired and staying up till midnight before coming here. Um, we had to get two new trustees <laughs> just to to help us uh, put the offer in, first of all. Someone who would uh, go forward and, and arrange the purchase and, and then loans as well from Australia and lawyers and contracts and... So many things just to get us to the point where we can put in an offer. So we're hoping that's going to happen this week. We have no idea if it's going to be enough for the rather greedy... Uh, sorry, sorry. Maybe it's just his job. Maybe it's just his job. But it's really interesting when you do live around ethical people 
And I just presume everybody's honest and trustworthy. And then after a while I realised, hmm, something smells a bit fishy. Mm. Uh, there's sort of people that you're not quite sure if they're real or not, or the buyers, you know, with lots of money. And Hmm. Different things said about the condition of the house and things like this. So that's interesting. So we don't really know um, what the next steps are going to be. <laughs> Although I do cultivate a lot of meta, I'm also pretty uh, clued in to when people are being uh, shifty. So I can imagine there'll be a bit of a game going on, but we'll see. So we'll see what happens next. And uh, if it doesn't happen this time, it'll happen soon. All of us are saying, well, it's a good practice. <laughs> <laughs> practice wrong, you know. But hopefully we'll actually uh, be able to go forward and then uh, I will need people to come and stay and to stay long term actually and uh, steward the place and be uh, have the opportunity to do something like the coordinators here yeah something similar to that but looking after the monastic sangha yeah and it's great because there are a few women interested or it's exploring ordination so yeah once there's a place People see a choice that they didn't see before and then some people get attracted to that choice. When there is no choice, then nobody would even consider ordaining as a nun. And when the only choice is pretty good, I mean, you get a nice monastery and there's lots of monks and nuns at some of the monasteries here, but not good enough because they're still um, only ever allowed to be novices and never t allowed to take the full ordination, which means they can't ordain their own nuns, they can't lead their own communities their way, you know, the way women might do it, which might be different from uh, the existing models. So it's like a really major glass ceiling, you know, like in any, it's like being told, okay, well, you can train in medicine, but you can only ever be a nurse. Nothing wrong with being a nurse, but what if you want to be a doctor, <laughs> you know? So that's what we're trying to do. And uh, it's lovely because we seem to attract a really diverse community. A lot of people who've been brought up around monks' monasteries have been conditioned to believe that it's not possible to have fully ordained nuns. So we don't tend to get a lot of Thai support or a lot of any traditional uh, Buddhist support. We get people, families, individuals from all different backgrounds and ethnic groups and, yeah, and ages and genders and but yeah so in a way it's very nice because we have a kind of relationship that we build up with these people they're not just coming because it's something that's uh, traditional or something they're brought up with they're coming because they receive something so we do have a nice community developing it's hard work but it's promising and uh, Sometimes extremely inspiring, actually. Yeah. Sometimes the things that exhaust you are also the meaningful. I guess that's why I can let myself give that much. <laughs> yeah. So that's the update. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question. <laughs> this is not a question. I've just started reading a book called All About Love, New Visions by Bell Hooks. If I finish it in time, I will give you the copy. Yay, thank you very much. I haven't read a whole book by Bell Hooks. I've read excerpts, which are always very brilliant and very socially engaged. And Yeah, they really break boundaries, break down walls. So that's wonderful. Yeah. I keep thinking I should get all these different books about it, but really, I suppose, practising it is the best. So don't hurry to finish it. <laughs> Enjoy it at your own speed, and uh, take it back if you want, because I can always, uh, you can always put it in the post to the new Vihara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's very nice. We still have ten minutes, so are there any... Um... Now, I'm recording this, so if anybody does want to say anything or feedback, is that OK? 
okay. If not, you'll have to let me know afterwards and I'll edit it out, I guess. Are there any... Uh, but your names won't be mentioned. I won't mention any names. Yes? Question um, that I thought about in between falling asleep. <laughs> um, uh, let me try and think how best to phrase it. How, um, how do you know if, um, if, and if the responsibility lies with you for not loving well enough, or whether there's, um, or when when do you know the difference mm. between you're not loving well enough versus the relationship needs to change? Mm. So like I really struggle with that understanding the difference between or how to differentiate between really accepting and embracing a situation and. Um, bringing as much kind of loving kindness yeah. and compassion to it as you can right. versus um, there's something about the situation that is causing yeah. barriers to loving kindness that needs to yeah. change in order for that to grow. Right, right, right. Well, first of all, um, I think it's important never to just look at yourself and think, if I love more, you know, then everything will be okay or maybe it isn't okay because I don't love enough or well enough because it's always a relationship. So it's never possible to transform a relationship alone. Both people have to participate in that. And you can only ever love as well as you can, so it is enough. It totally is enough. It has to be. That's what you can give. So if that isn't coming back from the other person or if that isn't appreciated or it's not leading to something that's healthy and nourishing for you both, then it might be that either you can talk about it and maybe go to counselling or have some you know, facilitation in some way, but sometimes you could also just burn out in that situation, you know, trying to make something that isn't healthy, healthy. Especially if you're trying to do it alone, it'll just lead to feelings of failure and, and exhaustion and maybe resentment as well. So, yeah, I think being able to ask for what you need as well from the other person as well as uh, asking yourself what more you can give. Perhaps ask for what you need. And um, first you might have to find out what it is you need and see if it's available as well. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Thank you for the question. In, in, in the um, loving kindness meditation, because I think for me maybe it brings up like when you mention safety, I'm, I'm like, oh, am I safe? <laughs> <laughs> it's like my my sort of my, whatever it is. It's like, oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not. So it feels like perhaps it's more like a a felt sense, and the concept is like. Uh, a bit loaded for me. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, when you were saying, like, feel like you're safe in your mother's arms, I was like, I don't know, it didn't, it felt like kind of stirring. Um, mm. But if I just tune in, I think I do, I think I do feel safe here. If I like, mm. just tune in to feeling of love and kindness, and I kind of feel relaxed. So. Yeah. It's just interesting yeah. to me. Yeah, thank you for sharing, yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. And I wonder... Hmm. Perhaps it's deep... Perhaps we have to see the little places we still don't feel safe in order to deepen the safety we do feel. I don't know. And perhaps we have to ask that question, am I safe? 
because we're safe enough, obviously, mm-hmm. to be here, to be mm-hmm. together, to meditate the way we are, mm-hmm. but maybe there's a deeper sense of being resourced enough to let go a bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, sometimes for me, if I find there's a blockage in meditation, it won't go, or isn't going deeper. I do have the sense that I'm not fully, fully safe enough to relax to the point where I can really just be exactly as I am and feel that's okay. It's not even that I need to be more safe necessarily externally, but it's like, am I really safe in myself with my emotions? Am I really at ease with whatever's going to arise it's like a kind of inner safety as well yeah and I mean yeah I'm aware that it can be loaded to bring up parents as well but um, I guess I feel most safe when I think of the people who represent true loving kindness in my life and sometimes I do start my meditation by just imagining they're there seated around me the Buddha can be there and then I've got three amazing teachers who my preceptor and other Kalyanamitta and then Ajahn Brahm I usually place behind me because he he is like he's even said I've got your back you know Mm -hmm. so it's like he's got my back and then it helps me to feel safe because I trust them so much, which is which is quite nice. So I guess there's always a little bit more safety and ease we can develop. Any one last? I just wondering about that question. Why is it easier to be yeah. and to ourselves than others? And I just felt like um, maybe that's true, but not for everybody. I think mm. well, like some people are selfish and greedy. Mm. And they are very kind to themselves. You know, too much. <laughs> I don't know. That's what came up for me. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good point. It's mm. a good point. Uh, when they're selfish and greedy, is it really love? Depends what we mean by love, but uh, all kindness. Yeah, because I do think whether it's directed inward or outward, it has to have those same qualities of selflessness and and genuine kindness, which is humble, (laughs) not proud and demanding in nature, right? Um, But it's interesting you bring it up because I think that the fear of narcissism, there are a lot of narcissistic people. I mean, we're brought up in probably a pretty narcissistic world, really. Um, So we all have that. But then there are, of course, also like narcissistic personality disorders, whether you like those labels or not. I mean, just to identify patterns, I think they can be helpful. And I think it's partly our fear of that that, gives us a resistance to developing love and kindness to ourselves, which is really a shame. Because if it's genuine love and kindness, it's a wish for our true well-being and ease. True well-being means spiritual well-being, which means that we become more selfless. Right? I mean, true love and kindness is selfless. It gives. And... By giving, we don't lose either. So it, it resources us and others. It's the same love, just directed differently. But for people that do worry about this question, and you know, sometimes in meta circles they say things like, "Oh, you can't love others if you can't love yourself," which I totally disagree with. I have to say, because I think love can be developed wherever it's easy to grow. I think you can develop it towards an easy person, which may not be yourself. It's often not. And mostly in these retreats, I start with a loved person. But I think it's nice to just give yourself a bit first. But uh, you can develop it. 
towards someone who's easy, and that will start to fill you up too. Yeah, because this is not the kind of love that leads to sorrow or leads to any kind of lack of energy. It's very resourcing and beautiful. Yeah, it's a big question, really. Beautiful. Help me, Ajahn Brahm, I remember once said that, like when we try to give loving kindness to ourselves, we are not big headed, but we are big hearted. Mm. And I, like hearing that, um, kind of helped me to be more softer on myself. Yeah. So like with this reflection that we did earlier, like to recall something good about ourselves. So for me it's very similar. So like I feel differently because sometimes yeah I can think about like whatever good thing about myself and I feel like oh there's a difference I felt that that my ego. But then when I feel calmer and softer I can recognize that this is actually genuine loving kindness mm. and kind of thinking about that this is not being big headed this is about being big hearted mm. and that's okay yeah that's beautiful yeah <laughs> yeah giving yourself the benefit of the doubt and the uh, appreciation yeah. that you give to others yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> so nice to talk about this. I love, I love loving kindness. <laughs> That's another meaning of the word loving kindness. <laughs> That's what we're doing, loving kindness. Mm. That's very nourishing. Yeah, and just to say for those who are just starting with this practice. Really be tender with yourself and don't um, stretch the plant to grow. <laughs> There's this really nice uh, story from Ajahn Brown again of uh, a farmer and he goes down with his son and teaches his son to plant some seeds and the son plants these seeds in the soil and, uh, and every day they go and water them and the sun shines on the seeds and after about two or three days, the little boy is like, where are the seeds? He's getting kind of frustrated. And then one day, after about a week, he's been watching them every day, they shoot a little bit, and there's a little tiny shoot. So he gets really excited. When are they going to grow? When are they going to grow? When are they going to have a flower? And then they carry on, and his dad says, you know, just wait, they'll flower in their own time. And, and the little boy goes back, and then they're like this big. And this carries on a little bit longer. And one day the boy goes back and he just can't bear it anymore. So he starts stretching them to try and make them grow. <laughs> and of course, he spoils all the plants. They all snap. And that's the end of it. So this is <laughs> like us sometimes. We try to stretch ourselves. We try to open our hearts as big as they can be before we're really ready. So just allow the process to to work itself out or to work itself open, if you like. Uh, when your whole body and mind feels ready, it'll, you just suddenly feel a flourishing and sometimes nothing for the whole day and then sometimes just a softness. Or sometimes you might even have a rush of PT, of bliss, fill you up and next session your mind might be all over the place. It doesn't matter, it's just about gradually pointing your mind in that direction and cultivating new habits, new attitudes. So. Good. Uh, it's time for bed. <laughs> Does that sound good? And remember, before you sleep, just have a few thoughts of loving kindness, perhaps to yourself or anyone else you're thinking of. And that will help you have a deep sleep.